What's going on guys, and welcome back to part 9 of my journey to Fantastic Beasts, The Secrets of Dumbledore series. Today I am going to be talking about Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, a film which has gotten a mostly mixed reception since its release. Some people believe that it is an unnecessary addition to the Harry Potter franchise, while some people love it and prefer it to a majority of the Harry Potter film series. I personally agree with the latter assessment. I think this film is fantastic, stands on its own very well while also being a great addition to the franchise, is essentially a perfect prequel, and nails what, in my opinion, modern blockbusters should be like. Now, this film is a great prequel because it expands the wizarding world, something that in the original series was mostly relegated to a single location, Hogwarts. In this film, you explore New York City and you learn how the wizarding community operates within a different country, even down to their slang terms, such as how they refer to muggles as nomadges. They apply real-world events to the story, such as the Second Salemers, which are obviously a play on the Salem witch trials that occurred during the 1600s. It's interesting to see how real-life events can be implemented into a fictional story like this, and it's set during a different time period. This film takes place during the 1920s. At the beginning of the film, Jacob Kowalski references how he just returned from the war, and you see how the wizarding world is essentially on the brink of war. You actually see the conflict taking place between the wizarding and muggle worlds, something that was only really briefly touched on in the Harry Potter series. It also isn't overly reliant on nostalgia. The only things I can really think of reference the original Harry Potter series in any capacity are that you hear Hedwig's theme for maybe five seconds, Dumbledore is briefly referenced, you see the Deathly Hallows symbol, and a character is referenced who shares the same last name as a character from Harry Potter. Compare that to something like Spider-Man No Way Home, which is essentially just a giant reference to all the old Spider-Man movies without telling a story on its own. This film feels like it was birthed from an actual idea for a story that introduces you to a great cast of new characters rather than resurrecting a bunch of old ones for nostalgia's sake. Speaking of those characters, they have now become some of my favorites from the entire wizarding world. One of them being Jacob Kowalski, who you can tell went through a lot of traumatic experience during the war and that as a result of that, magic is really the best thing that's ever happened to him. He's even able to find love through it by meeting Queenie Goldstein. And he's not funny because he's dumb, like let's say Ron from the Harry Potter films. He's funny because Dan Fogler has excellent comedic timing and they know how to execute humor with his character. Scenes don't come to a screeching halt because they have to tell a joke to the audience. I feel like Jacob Kowalski is a prime example of how to do comedic relief right, because not only is he a funny character, but he also has integrity outside of that. And Newt Scamander is quite possibly my favorite Harry Potter character of all time, right up there with Neville Longbottom. My reason for that is because he's essentially the Harry Potter equivalent of Bilbo Baggins from The Hobbit, who if you didn't know is my favorite protagonist of all time. That is because they are simple people who have nothing to do with the conflicts occurring, but choose to get involved out of the goodness of their hearts. Now, I'm not saying that characters like Harry Potter or Luke Skywalker are bad protagonists. They're well-written characters, but they are the chosen one, and from the beginning of their stories, they have a moral obligation to do good because they have been prophesized to defeat evil. But characters like Bilbo and Newt have no reason to go outside of their comfort zone in order to help others, but they still choose to. In fact, Dumbledore perfectly describes this in The Crimes of Grindelwald. You know why I admire you, Newt? What? More perhaps than any man I know. You do not seek power or popularity. You simply ask, is a thing right in itself? 
It is, you do it no matter the cost. Towards the end of this film, without being prompted by anybody, Newt is willing to jump in and sacrifice his life to protect a child. If that isn't heroism, I don't know what is. At the end of the day, he is the one who is able to subdue temporarily the ultimate threat, that being Grindelwald. And you guys know that I sure do love myself a good message of the underdog triumphing over the villain. This film is also a prime example of how I feel modern blockbusters should be handled in the fact that it has all of the things you would expect from a modern blockbuster, but there's always something of substance under the surface, and that is what I need in films like this. If there's nothing under the surface, then why should I care? I've mentioned this countless times, but in the film Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, there's a big CGI final battle, which I don't love, but there is an emotional core, that being the relationship between Shang-Chi and his father. The problem, however, is that the second Shang-Chi's father dies, that emotional core is lost, and all we have left is a giant CGI smash fest, which I don't care about at all. The final battle of this film, on the surface, would appear to be the same, but the big CGI blob that everyone's fighting at the end is really just a scared child. The climax of this film is the protagonist comforting a scared and abused child. Something rather poignant. At no point during the climax of this film does it lose that emotional center, and as a result, it remains an engaging experience. The tone is also consistent. The characters within the film treat everything that is happening as if it is a serious matter. So although the plot of seeing Newt and his friends going on an adventure to reclaim his beast is fun to watch, it's also rather serious, because if they don't reclaim the beast, they could get arrested and potentially executed for a crime they didn't commit. Compare that to something like Avengers Endgame, which is meant to be the aftermath of the apocalypse, but despite that, the characters are joking around like it's nothing, which conflicts with the tone the film had already established. It also doesn't suffer from overindulgent setup, which I've criticized a number of Marvel and Star Wars projects for recently. The Book of Boba Fett was particularly bad in this regard because half of the season was dedicated to setting up the Mandalorian season three, but this film doesn't have anything like that. We learn about Lita Lestrange and how she and Newt had some sort of relationship in the past, which is further explored in the sequel. We don't need to learn anything more about that in this film. They do set it up though, but just rather briefly. After Credence is apparently destroyed by the Aurors, we see a wisp of his Obscurus escaping through a hole in the street, which sets up his return in the sequel. Grindelwald is also revealed as having been behind everything at the end of the film, but he is quickly toted away by the Aurors so we can actually focus on resolving all of the plot lines and relationships that this film has built up. I guarantee you if this was a Marvel movie, they would have included some extra scene where after Grindelwald is taken to prison by the Aurors, you see him scheming with another prisoner to escape because they have to set up a sequel. But this film focuses its priorities. It knows what it's trying to achieve. It's telling a story about a small group of characters who eventually become embroiled in a larger conflict. You see that conflict brewing in this film, but it doesn't come to the forefront until the sequel. If I were to complain about anything in this film, I suppose it would be that there are some very minor discrepancies. For example, once Jacob and Newt are taken in by Tina and Queenie, Newt takes Jacob into a suitcase, and Jacob agrees to help him find all of his creatures that have been scattered across New York City. And in a later scene, we are shown Queenie and Tina discovering that they left the apartment, but I'm not sure how they got out of the apartment without bumping into Tina and Queenie. I suppose you're meant to assume that they apparated out of there, but that's never explicitly stated, so I'm not sure how they got out of there. Also, during the capture of the final beast, we see Jacob and Dougal the Demi guys, and then Dougal disappears, turning invisible again and assumedly escaping. Once they capture the Akami, we cut inside the suitcase and we see that they reclaimed the Demi guys somehow, despite the fact that they never showed that happen. The last time we saw him, he was disappearing out of sight, so 
When did they recover him? It would have been nice to see that, but these are just very minor details that do not ruin the overall experience of the film. This film is, in my opinion, the best the franchise has been since Chamber of Secrets, which is still my favorite Harry Potter film. I know that's a controversial opinion, but frankly, I don't care. To me, this film actually feels like it was made by people who care about telling good stories, rather than a bunch of studio executives producing a cash grab piece of nostalgia bait, which I I really do feel like is due to JK Rowling's skill as a writer. But you guys please let me know. What are your thoughts on Fantastic Beasts and where to find them? Do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? Just whatever your thoughts are, please let me know them all in the comments below. And of course, as always, I hope you guys have a great day. Take care. Bye.